Hi everyone, uh, I'm Arun Chandrasekhar. Uh, I am the program manager for Azure Open Source Integration. So our team works on integrating things like uh, uh, Jenkins, Ansible, Chataform, etc., to Azure. Um, today I'm just going to talk, focus mostly on Terraform, which is also my core focus for the past few uh, months, and kind of talk about a little bit about uh, how it fits into. Uh, your multi-cloud strategy, hopefully. So, um, just a quick overview of, okay, so uh, if you think about uh, Edison, we know that he invented the light bulb, but it's really, as most of you here are probably into the infrastructure track, I don't have to tell you that this is, like Edison is not really, uh, like his genius is not just the light bulb, but it's also the, the fact that he uh, built GE the grid, right? So the infrastructure that made the, the electricity available on tap. So that's kind of one of the big things on which there was a book written a while ago called The Big Switch. How many of you have read The Big Switch? Anybody? Okay. So this is like, a, it's pretty dated. It's, it's around 10 years ago where um, Nicholas Carr equated the uh, sort of the bulb and GE with uh, where software infrastructure is going. And he basically said that eventually we'll be able to get like compute on tap, just like you get electricity on tap today, right? So it's been 10 years, so um, are we there yet? So that's kind of the question, right? Are we, are we there? Do you, do you all feel that we are now at the point where everybody gets compute on tap just like you switch on a light? How many of you agrees with that level of sophistication? <laughs> okay, so there are a few people here who are optimists, <laughs> but we're not there yet, right? But at least... We have people getting really interested here. So this is the last survey uh, of RightScale, uh, the latest one, which basically says people care about multi-cloud, at least big enterprises do, and multi-cloud is a nuanced thing. It's not just the three or four big public providers, but it's also the sort of hybrid where I, I want things that go beyond my boundary, right? beyond the, beyond the cloud, my on-premise boundary or my Azure boundary. So my talk is really about what you can do now and what you, you can uh, sort of work with uh, in terms of Terraform uh, across the board, across providers, but not just across providers, but also across uh, sort of cloud boundaries and across uh, third-party providers. So that's kind of the, the Uber goal of this talk. So just to get a show of hands, how many of you that identify as uh, ops or, or IT? <coughs> so it's about half the room. How many of you would identify as DevOps? Okay, so uh, slightly less. And how many of you would identify as developers? Okay, so uh, very little. So I'm going to sort of tailor the talk based on that. So I'll probably start off with sort of the ops view, and then the DevOps view, and then the dev view. About cloud native. Sorry? What about cloud native? Yeah, the cloud native view will keep coming up in all of that. So it's sort of sprinkled across everything. Um, so let me start with sort of just based on the count here. Let's start with the ops view of the world. So IT with a lot of open source, as all of you are, obviously, because you're in Linux web, wants to be a vendor agnostic, right? But there's also this sort of um, evolution that's going on in infrastructure where you have the mainframe all the way to, to functions, to serverless. And like just like if you think about it from the big switch context, it's like the, the future... As, as, as Yogi Berra would put it, the future ain't what it used to be, right? So it's, it's a little bit trickier than, like the echo chamber is always saying everybody goes to cloud native. Everybody's talking about a march towards mm. serverless and a march towards cloud native. But I, I feel that this is just a continuum where, I mean, there's, there's, there's no, uh, in today's day and world, mainframes and monoliths have, a, have an important role to play. They exist. They're not, they're not just because... Uh, they uh, have been created ages ago, doesn't mean that banks are going to give them up anytime soon, right? So all of these, it's just a continuum where people use the mainframes, people use functions, and it's a mix of all these, and, and it depends on what kind of infrastructure you care about. So if you think about uh, uh, Terraform, it's really about addressing that layer of that continuum. So it's about, I have my traditional data center sitting on-premise, I have a bunch of machines, or I have a private cloud with VMware or Rackspace, 
uh, I mean, I might have rented it, or I might just be using it as VMware or something like that. Or I have uh, a whole bunch of uh, cloud providers. So Terraform is really about how do you uh, become the XML of that world, right? Sort of like the de facto standard language for you to go and provision these things. I don't want to learn a lot of verbose JSON with, uh, with Azure resource management templates or cloud formation templates or uh, this ultra uh, simple looking language called deployment YAML, which actually it, it becomes really painful because it's like there's a whole broad swath of these things uh, that languages that different providers give you. And then Terraform says, no, I'll just give you a very simple uh, language that'll, that'll be good enough and it'll let you work on all these. But a lot of people get into that thing that, oh, okay, this is an abstraction then. It's sort of something that will work across clouds in a cloud agnostic manner. To be very clear, Terraform will never do that. So Terraform is not intended to do that because Terraform is not intended to be like the Java, the, you know, the JVM, uh, least common denominator of this world. It's about you use the best aspects of every single provider and you use them consciously, saying I want to use, uh, say, some exotic service of Azure that's not even standardized across everything. Like say, I want to use Data Lake or something like that, so a service that may, many of you may not even heard of. So, uh, Terraform is saying I provision anything. I can provision function apps. I can provision Lambda functions. I can provision anything. It doesn't say I want to only provision IaaS or I want to only provision virtual machines, right? So it's about being uh, multi-cloud truly rather than cloud agnostic. And that distinction is what makes it really powerful and which is why it's something that all the cloud providers are uh, rushing to standardize on. So let's take like a simple infra kind of situation, right? So if I want to take um, something like this architecture, this is a typical architecture that you'd use in Azure where you want to uh, just use virtual machines. This is sort of the analog to auto-scaling groups. How many of you understand? How many of you use Azure at all? Okay, so about uh, less of the room. So just in terms of, uh, think of the, how many of you use AWS? Okay, so about half. So uh, just for the rest of you, the idea of a scale set, the VM scale set, for those who are aware of auto-scaling groups in, uh, in AWS, it's, a, it's the same kind of concept. Um, I want to basically go and create this kind of an infrastructure with, this, with, a, with a DNS in the front, uh, I have a load balancer, mm -hmm. and I want to just provision this with, uh, with managed disks and some kind of storage account. So this is a typical uh, IaaS kind of infrastructure. About a year ago, I, I sort of started working on Terraform uh, with, with Azure, and Hashikov had their own uh, provider, and then we just came up with a very simple uh, Azure RM, like an like Azure, uh, more native Azure provider that supported this one scenario. This is the only scenario we supported. We, we didn't support anything else. And this alone gave us like a huge amount of traction in this world. So this is sort of our experiment, just getting our, our feet wet. and. We, we sort of immediately got embraced by, this is a quote by Elon Musk, when uh, OpenAI, which is basically one of their, uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with OpenAI. So OpenAI is, is sort of like what you think of, or like open source. Think of opening out AI and standardizing it in order to build out uh, ethics and make the, make the sort of artificial intelligence uh, slightly more, uh, uh, sort of, slightly less dangerous in Elon Musk's view of the world and slightly more open, right? So it's about making, adding ethical standards to it. But the OpenAI team basically had a Kubernetes cluster that they spun up on their own, but they said, okay, I want to use, uh, I want like a lot of brute force scale on this. I want to add like, uh, like around, I had about 100,000 cores or something that they want to add to, try it out on, uh, to, to sort of quickly spin up and do a bunch of AI that it compute and then tear it down. And, they, they tried it with AWS, they, they succeeded, but the only thing they found was it was too expensive because of the, just the pricing model. It had nothing to do with the, I mean, AWS obviously can do everything that Azure can do, it's just that we were much cheaper to do the same thing. So they just decided, okay, let's try uh, Azure. For this, we are, we, are, we are nice with these burst kind of scenarios where just burst a whole bunch of cores and, and spin it down. So they, they spun up their own Kubernetes cluster on top of the uh, this infrastructure and uh, they, they actually won the, uh, there was a multiplayer game, I forget the name of it. Uh, it was like, sort of like, think of it as uh, like when uh, Gary Kasparov beat some, uh, beat Watson or the equivalent of Watson in, in the, the big blue uh, in chess. This is like 
several dimensions more complex because it's a multiplayer game that the AI went in and beat. It was the first time an AI beat uh, a multiplayer game. So that was kind of interesting. So what OpenAI want is their multi-cloud strategy is very simple, nothing sticky. So including Kubernetes, they, they will never use ECS or, or manage Kubernetes or any other stuff. They just put everything they want exactly the way they want it and they wanted to work on whichever cloud they care about. So that's one extreme uh, of, of customer who put everything on bare metal or as in bare IS uh, with, with Packer based managed disks. But then uh, this sort of uh, also picked the interest of a whole bunch of enterprises who are now like, okay, I can use uh, Azure with, I'm already using Terraform, so I, might as well, I can start using Azure to do the exact same things and I can start modeling uh, a whole bunch of complex network topologies on top of this. So they got, they thought, oh, well, Microsoft is in because we just did this very simple VM scale set based thing. And that's when uh, they started giving us these really interesting requirements. And their stuff is not as simple, right? Theirs is much more messy. So if you look at their topology, they're looking, typically this is the most typical topology. You, you won't be able to see the details of it. But just to give you a, a high level view of what it looks like, uh, basically, they have a whole bunch of shared services, uh, like SAP or, or a whole bunch of things that they use on-premise. They have uh, a bunch of stuff that they want hooked up really rapidly using something like Express Route, which is just a very fast pipe to from from your uh, to treat your data center and the Azure data center as one single van without worrying about network latency issues. And then they said, okay, I want central IT to still govern and manage everything because they're enterprise. So they want to make sure that central IT governs every aspect of the, of the, of the, um, uh, all the, all the things that are exposed in their network, so egress and ingress on the top layer. But they want application developers to still use this nice thing, uh, like infrared code, as they add their specific infrastructure to the central IT, right? So, I said fine, so this is something that should be doable. Azure has all the different aspects to it, but the beauty of Terraform is that it's sort of the great leveler. So immediately we came up with a bunch of requirements to the platform teams that said, we want something called an app security group, and that's something that actually they released uh, about six months ago in preview, and it's now GA. So the idea was, I as an application, that the top level guy just defined a bunch of CIDR blocks saying, I have these sort of, uh, I'll give each of these subnets to different application develop, development teams. And then the, the application development teams will write the infra, like VM scale sets or, or uh, whatever they want uh, on top of it. It could even be pass like function apps or whatever they want in, in it, and then fit it into that sort of global VNet. And then have a VNet gateway that will let you do global VNet peering on top of it. So that means that effectively I can take stuff as an application team throw it into this broader uh, central IT defined uh, uh, sort of security stack and then ensure that I'm, I'm con uh, conforming the policy while I'm doing this. So this was something that we've been spending the last, uh, probably, I mean, three months ago we kind of got it. This is about like six, nearly six months. It took us with a lot of changes to the platform and a lot of changes to uh, the way we did the Terraform provider. And now this is something that you can do. So this is when we, we started feeling that, okay, Terraform, started off as a thing that I can give for sort of a DevOps team that's really sophisticated, but then Terraform is now something that anybody in ops, all the way from the scale of a tiny startup like the OpenAI to something like an enterprise, could use in serious production scenarios. This is not just dev test workloads, they're not experimenting with it, they're actually using it for their, uh, and this is some, some of the companies that I mentioned here. All of them now use Terraform with Azure, and uh, for example, if you think of the Adobe Cloud Platform, there's Terraform with Azure, and there are a whole, whole, whole bunch of others who didn't allow me to share like the, their names. But there's like a whole bunch of others. Think of like all these abstracted cloud platforms and think of the top three or four most popular ones. Uh, all of them are using Terraform to provision themselves on Azure. One that I can share, of course, is Pivotal. I mean, the Cloud Foundry obviously uses uh, Terraform. That's an open source project that they have called Terraforming uh, that you can use with Azure. Um, so so with that, let me just quickly show you uh, a few high-level things. How many of you are familiar with Terraform? Because I'm sort of, okay. So let me then start with the basics. There's just a few of you here. Um, let me just go through 
a very simple demo then. Let me not do the... So, <clears throat> the first thing you'll see is Terraform has this thing called a module registry. Think of it as some kind of a, uh, like a hub, like Docker Hub or, uh, or GitHub for source. This is just a, a, a hub for modules. And modules are these sort of higher level abstraction. So uh, just pulling back, so uh, because a lot of you are not familiar with Terraform. So Terraform is, is, uses a language that is not very verbose like JSON, but it's not like, like ultra simple like uh, YAML. It's somewhere in between. It's called the Hashikov configuration language. Think of it as a very simple way to express things without any of the annoyances of heavy nesting that JSON has, and without any of the uh, deceptive simplicity that say a deployment YAML has. It looks so simple, but it's really painful to do anything. Uh, meaningful with it, right? So it was really done as a thing because a lot of people thought that cloud formation and the ARM were horrible in terms of when you want to do really complex topologies for in JSON. And because it's a DSL, it's like a domain specific language for infrastructure as code on top of JSON, it can now do, uh, it can do any levels of, it can do the layer of abstraction. The layer of abstraction here is not across anything. It's just a layer of abstraction that says, I can do a bunch of smart defaults Spin me up a network, spin me up a, something like a compute group, which could be a VM scale set, it could be auto scaling group. Spin me up these things, or spin me up console or Kubernetes on, on Azure without needing to worry about writing even the entire Terraform. So you just write, it'll default all the best practice ways of doing things inside this module, which is a Terraform file itself, and abstract away the complexity of provisioning stuff for you. So that's what a module does. And modules are extremely valuable things for the ops folk amongst you. Because you can use modules not just in the public registry. You have verified modules. These are not like examples. These are not like quick starts like that you see in Amazon or Azure or, or Google. These are actual production quality uh, reusable modules that people actually use in production today. So an example is a security group of one of those has hundreds of thousands of downloads. It's not like every developer. There are hundreds of thousands of developers downloading it. It's just that that module is directly used in production. right? So just reference from this public registry, just like a Docker Hub image. The second thing is uh, the modules can be privately used. So it's very easy to put your modules into there's a bunch of backends that Hashikov has, like Bitbucket or Git or wherever. You can take those modules and create your own private registry of these. So that becomes the key thing that a lot of the central IT teams, a lot of ops teams focus most of their energies on is just use Terraform with uh, uh, build out a set of modules that either compose these things or compose different providers and get exactly what I want. So that becomes a very powerful uh, concept. So let's just take an example of uh, load balancer, right? Normally, if you were to write a load balancer in any language, you'd have to write a whole bunch of code. But what you would need to write to spin up a load balancer here is just this piece of code. So you don't have to write all the different layers of IP routing and everything else that you need to define. Because in your enterprise, somebody would have defined it for you. So this is the best practice way to spin up a load balancer. Don't ask me what it is, just it's, it's hidden under the covers, right? So that's kind of the, the beauty of it. One other thing that Azure has, you can do the same thing. Uh, what we've done in Azure is, uh, like in our, oh, we have this uh, sort of our browser based shell, which is actually a container instance. So think of it as, as actually a, a, an Azure container instance that sits. Uh, behind, uh, with, a, with a managed Kubernetes uh, cluster behind it, but it's completely like unbeknownst to you, obviously. So just a, it's just a shell that you can ask for anytime you go into Azure. Just go to shell.azure.com, you'll get it. Where you can go and provision anything you want in Azure. Or third party now, because you can use Terraform. So what we did was we took the container instance, we took the Docker image behind it, and we went and tubed it, and like sort of tweaked it. We, I mean, as in Microsoft, I mean, it was not open, uh, the container instance is available in Docker Hub, but uh, obviously we, this is the, that instance is what's running here. It's instantiating a container instance right now. The beauty of it is you now have the, uh, you now have Terraform, Ansible, AZ CLI, a whole bunch of things just available to you out of the box here. So you don't have to set up any of these, these things manually. Anytime you switch on a cloud shell, you, you get into, uh, you, you get a, a configured Terraform instance for you. Hopefully it will work. Anyway. Let me try refreshing. And there's another way to do it is also from Azure. If you go to portal.azure.com, you can just spin up one here. 
Let me try that as well. So back up. Let's see one of these should work, but it didn't. Something weird going on. Um, let me come back to this. Okay, let me just come back to this later. Um, you have the Wi-Fi? I have the Wi-Fi, yeah. It's kind of unreliable using door. <laughs> yeah, this should just work. Which Wi-Fi? Um, the Linux Fest one. Linux Fest one? There's some port blocking there. Oh, there is? Ah, mm -hmm. uh, well. This is just a GPS. Sorry? This is just HTTPS. It's just HTTPS. I, mean, I can try it from an Azure VM, maybe. That'll help. Let's see. Uh, let me just try it from within a VM that should provide it. Let's see. Just continue this. We'll come back to it. Let's try it in a bit, see if it starts working. But luckily, just for this kind of scenario, I do have like a, sorry, um, a backup set of hidden slides that we can now show you in case this didn't work. So basically think of it as if you were in a terminal uh, in MASH, what you would define is something where you define like a network you define a resource group, a location, and you can override a few optional inputs in there. And then what Terraform, when you do in it, it, it downloads the module from that registry that I just showed you, and then it initializes the provider plugin, which we'll go into uh, next, which is sort of the native provider that it supports. That's kind of all it does. So that's, that's all a module is. So module is nothing but just an abstraction that lets you uh, define with very little inputs a really complex network topology, or an application like Elk clusters, or console or Cassandra, whatever you want, right? That's kind of the, the basis of this. Of course, people are not going to use it literally the same way. Some, some people do for basic things like security groups, but for these kind of things, they would take it, fork it, and do the needful for their specific uh, scenarios. And if it worked, this is what it kind of looked like. I'll go into the portal, it has Terraform in there, and you can go and uh, just run this, uh, not just from a bash, from a terminal, you can also run it directly in the portal. Uh, and it'll just go and create those resources for you. And you don't need any auth information here because we now support something called managed service identity where the Cloud Shell container instance is now given a, a well-known identity that doesn't use your user session anymore. It can have a very well-defined, like, I am role kind of thing, right? Where you can just say, this is a role that this, this Cloud Shell instance has. It can access these resources. Uh, and that gives you the ability to do this without needing to think about, oh, I have, to, I have to set up environment variables or security tokens or access tokens and so on. None of that stuff. <coughs> uh, any questions at this point? Okay. Let me go to... So let me quickly switch gears and go to dev, though I know that a few of you have DevOps here. I just want to sort of uh, switch to the other extreme of the world. So this is sort of the ops. What can ops do with Terraform? So they have these modules, they have these really nice abstractions, you have this registry, and then you can sort of play with running, play with them, use them in, in the cloud shell. It's integrated, uh, and you don't have to do too much to learn stuff. I, I'll tell you something in, in the roadmap that's much more interesting um, a bit later. But again, for developers, it's the same deal. You go all the way from COBOL to functions, uh, and, and everybody's in a continuum of these things. I mean, COBOL, maybe not so much, but there are a lot of monolith apps that exist today. Majority of compute that runs on any cloud is just monolithic apps. It's not, people haven't even embraced SOA, and those guys are an advantage, because a lot of monoliths 
are leapfrogging to containers and they aspire to do microservices and functions. So they, 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 they sort of didn't follow the best practice of SOA at all and they, they, now have, they, are, they are actually at an advantage. They don't have to unlearn any of the uh, SOA stuff. So again, it's the same deal. You have the hybrid infrastructure, but developers don't care about infrastructure, right? So they, they, they care about their sort of uh, tiers. So they are an end tier application, they have web tier, business tier, maybe a back end tier. And developers could do this, which is what they do, like a sophisticated uh, sort of uh, DevOps shops would say, I want to control everything all the way from VMs, and they'll have load balancers of VMs and build out these sort of complex, uh, it's not complex, but just a lot of hardware, uh, like a lot of virtual machine uh, infrastructure to, to enable their applications. However, this is where the leapfrogging really helps, is that you, you basically, you can actually build a real true abstraction across clouds with an application platform, right? You cannot build a really true abstraction across clouds using infrastructure because every cloud wants to differentiate in terms of infrastructure. They want to do something different. They have like Azure has 100 services, Amazon has another 100 services that, that don't have a complete nice intersection in a Venn diagram. And they have completely different values. Beyond IaaS, they're like different value plays for different cohorts. Like we care a lot about security, we care a lot about uh, like large enterprises, uh, that kind of so the, the the priorities are slightly different, but if you look at app platforms, they are really for developers who want to abstract away the cloud. They saying, "Don't bother me about the the underlying infrastructure. I just want to work at the sort of nice uh, higher level of the world." So obviously, we have a native app platform, which is our app service platform, which has things like your functions and um, uh, API apps with gateways, uh, service bus. We have. Uh, web apps, so you can do web apps with Linux containers very trivially, uh, just like in, in Google you could do something like App Engine, right, without worrying about the underlying infrastructure. So you can do the same kind of stuff here, and you get all the goodness of a very sticky solution, which will have CDN and Azure Search and things which are like obviously things that Azure is is investing in, uh, but you can provision these in Terraform as well. So I'm extremely surprised that a lot of the the, the people are not looking at Terraform as a multi-cloud play only. There are like complete 100% Azure shops who still use Terraform for two reasons. One is, so we support each of these things in Terraform, so you can now provision like an Azure search, a CDN. Because they want to be able to use Azure and things outside the Azure body. They want to use that Datadog or New Relic or something else, right? So they just don't want to use uh, uh, only Azure, they want to use other things. So that's become a very common scenario for uh, people using Terraform. And of course, I mean, uh, the language is really, really brilliant. So uh, they also like the simplicity of it. But however, again, this is this Linux Fest. I don't think you're after stickiness. You're after sort of abstraction layers that are less sticky. So obviously, the leader in this space is Kubernetes, and uh, we just announced the, the managed Kubernetes uh, cluster. So what that gives you is it abstracts away the infrastructure services. You get a fully managed Kubernetes instance, and uh, you don't have to worry about like all the all the things that infrastructure folk worry about. So we're sort of giving you this uh, Azure Kubernetes service that lets you do things at the Kubernetes layer. So if you're a developer, you just use you want to use your containers, you don't care about, you want to use Docker, you don't care about anything beyond that, then this, this, is, this is something that works, uh, works well. But of course, even if you're a developer, you still need to figure out a way to spin up this guy in Azure. So you don't, you don't just go and click a few buttons because there's still configuration to be done for, for your Kubernetes cluster. So let me show you how that's done with Terraform. So let me switch to, oh wow, it actually succeeded. This took a while. So just to show you that the, the stuff there was not just demo, let me just try running this. And in the meantime, wh what do you think is the most popular tool today to order Terraform scripts? Any guesses? You think it's Sublime or Notepad plus plus? Yeah. You would think it's Sublime or Notepad plus, wouldn't you? What do you think? Both uh, Google and AWS and uh, like a lot of Microsoft developers use for Terraform. Microsoft developers used to use uh, to develop Terraform. Sorry. VS Code, yes. So VS Code is the is the tool that is used by AWS and by uh, Google and by us, and in fact, we work together in that context, because open source, we actually work 
uh, AWS built the Visual Studio Code extension for Terraform. So if you think about, if you go to Visual Studio Code, uh, you'll get a, let me just open it up here. I guess, can you see that? It's kind of, let me quickly open it up here. So when you, when you install an extension in VS Code, uh, that we built something called Azure Terraform, but there's also this Terraform instruction, and this is built by Mike, Michael Wollenflag, who works in, uh, in the AWS Berlin team. And um, we are not gonna, we are not really competing with that. It's an excellent extension, and I, I suggest you guys just install that. And that gives you like basic color highlighting, uh, references, and a whole bunch of nice things in VS Code. What we've done is we just built a, a, an extension uh, that's orthogonal to it, so it doesn't like it doesn't do the things that Terraform extension does, but it lets you do things that let you quickly test and run your things just the way I showed you in, Visual, in, in Cloud Shell, but using VS Code, right? So we, we kind of, we go and fix, like we, we, are, we give PRs to the Terraform thing if there's anything that we want to fix in the, in the core uh, linting capabilities, but if you want to add things that are Azure specific, we're just keeping it uh, in this Azure Terraform extension. So what does the Azure Terraform extension give you? So if you go to, uh, if you just go to the, the command target, so it let you do these things. So it lets you do these things called plan, push, apply, init, and visualize. Let me just show you visualize as an example. Uh, visualization. So one of the things it's saying here is interesting. It says, would you like to run it in the integrated terminal? So Visual Studio Code has its own integrated mesh terminal, but it also has uh, Cloud Shell. So what we have done is we have taken Cloud Shell, the one that you saw in the browser, and embedded it into Visual Studio Code to enable this scenario. So what this does is, now it's switching to local because I want to create a, a nice visualization of my my current uh, Terraform file. So basically, what this did is it just showed you what a Terraform file looks like. It's kind of neat. It's it's based on GraphWiz. It's just a regular uh, implementation that Terraform has. It shows the dependency graph that Terraform engine uses under the cover. So you can take any complex topology and visualize what's going on by looking at the uh, uh, by doing a visualize right here. Right. So that's uh, that's something that happens in your local machine. So you can use a local machine, just treat, do everything locally, not worry about Cloud Shell if you want, and run a bunch of Terraform commands. But if you want to use Cloud Shell, you don't want to install anything locally, you just want to uh, quickly try out something, then what you could do is uh, run one of these commands, and it says you want to open Cloud Shell. So what it's doing here is it's not going to go to the browser, it's just going to use Cloud Shell right in here. So this is kind of the, the second step. So what it's doing here is it's taken a Cloud Shell instance, container instance, and it's plonked in, into your uh, local VS Code uh, editor. Wait, can I ask you a question about that message right there? Yeah. Um, is Cloud Shell persistent, or is it like a container that dies? Ah, that's that's what I'm going to show you. Now. That's the next very next thing I'll show you. Just give me a second. Okay. So what did what what does that mean? So oh okay. So I'm doing this. The container instance. Container instance is going to die. So it's going to die. It's a session, right? It has it's vapor. But then you want to store your whatever you push statefully. So what we did was we, we in the extension we implemented the Cloud Drive implementation of Cloud Shell. So Cloud Shell has something called Cloud Drive, which is basically the, the backing Azure file system for Cloud Shell, <coughs> which is persisted in a storage account, in your storage account in Azure, in your subscription. So what this does is for, for your workspace that you see here, for every workspace that you have in, uh, in Visual Studio Code, it'll create a folder in the Cloud Drive. I right? think of Cloud Drive like S3, it's not like a, like, sort of like a blob, but it's not a blob, it has a file system-like feel to it. So it's like a cloud file system. And here you'll be able to use, like TFS, TFAKS2 is, the, is this workspace. So it just took this workspace, created it under the Cloud Drive, which means you can destroy a Cloud Shell hundreds of times, your files will still be intact, and next time you go and you'd see it. Um, the next thing you would do is do a plan. So the plan is one of the most beautiful things about Terraform. For those who don't know about, about Terraform, what it does is the, a very lightweight implementation of what uh, desired state configuration, say with Chef or PowerShell or Puppet does, right? So what, what does plan do? All it does is it says, I'm gonna check this file, I've seen this file, and I'm gonna see the actual state in Azure of what's, what, what exists in Azure today, and I'm gonna compare the two and see, okay, what, what do I need to change, right? So you could, do, you could have gone out of band and changed things in Azure. You could have gone and changed uh, things uh, like through some other Terraform file, but at any point you're guaranteed to know exactly what the delta is between the cloud and and uh, and your Terraform state. Now the Terraform state right now I've stored it in Cloud Drive, which is kind of okay. 
but it's not great because let's say if I have multiple people using it for production, then I cannot just use the same uh, Cloud Drive instance state. That's just the state me as a developer has. So I'll get back to that when we go to DevOps side of things, but think of it as broadly what you see here is the ability to say, okay, it knows that, okay, I've looked at this, I've looked at the state in Azure, and I know the only thing that needs to change is this tag, which is staging. I'm just changing this from staging to production, uh, and I'm saying, let's ship this guy to a production, right? So if we go to the resource here, you should see an environment called staging here, right? This is environment stage. So I'm just gonna go and apply this from here, and it will. what it will do is, basically go make that change, right? Just all it's gonna do is just change the tag to, but I mean, you can do really complex things uh, without worrying about what's gonna change. That's sort of the, the, the biggest value I see from a ops perspective for, and from a dev perspective as you do this. So now you can do this nice build debug cycle hundreds of times without worrying about something changing there that you don't know anything about. So let me go back, because we're kind of running out of time, let me go back quickly and talk about the DevOps side of things. So for DevOps, uh, we have several things that we invest in pretty deeply, um, some of them being Jenkins, Terraform, and Ansible. These are the top three things that we, that we, that we support <coughs> natively, as in Azure and Microsoft ha has basically taken up uh, a significant amount of uh, effort and, and significant bet in Jenkins and Terraform and Ansible as the sort of big three. Um, what, what that means is you cannot sort of make sure that these things work well together if you want to enable something. So, Let's say if you wanted to create uh, an immutable infrastructure with, uh, uh, like for doing continuous deployment, as a developer, I just want to keep continuously deploying, and I want this immutable infrastructure, then you can do that using a combination of Hashikov's packer, which is basically a thing that lets you bake uh, VHDs or, or AMIs into uh, some kind of store. And then you can go and uh, use uh, a telephone to actually provision the underlying VM scale set cluster with all the load balancer and everything else. And then you can use uh, Jenkins to do the actual continuous deployment, right? So now there's this nice integration between Terraform and Jenkins that we can just leverage. Because Jenkins already has a Terraform plugin, it works really well, and all you're doing is saying that it, it's, it'll give you this additional support. So with this, you can now take this to the next level where you can use the same set of things. I'm not gonna show you the details, I don't have time, but let me show you, like, high level, what does it take for you to do something like that? So as I said, the problem with the Cloud Drive is just me as a developer using uh, that instance. But for this kind of scenario, I need a Terraform instance in Azure, right? It has to be hosted because I'm using it across multiple developers in my team, doing it for CD. So what we did here was we actually implemented remote state, which is Terraform has this notion of remote state, which is that instead of using state locally to do my plan, I can use my state remotely in uh, Azure storage or S3 or wherever I want, right? So we implemented a, a remote state backend for Terraform and then we hosted a Terraform instance in Azure that is guaranteed to be the latest version of Terraform, and it's guaranteed to have the latest uh, implementation that you need of managed service identity, which is important because what you're doing there is you're saying this Terraform instance has its own identity, so I don't have to mess around with vault and secrets and tokens and any other stuff. It has its own uh, role-based access control, and it also has shared state. So now, now I can use this for real production scenarios. So this is the sort of the Terraform instance that you'll find uh, when you use this on Azure. And this is a differentiator, I'm Mike sure I have to say this, no other cloud does this today. Uh, no other cloud can, except with the commercial product, which is Terraform Enterprise, for which you have to pay some extra, extra bucks. Um, and this is free, I mean, not, everything I've showed you till now, there's nothing, I mean, there's no extra charge on top of compute, including AKS, Terraform, we just charge you the uh, underlying cost of the, the virtual machines that are running. So we don't we don't an overage for the service or the we don't do we don't overcharge for the uh, there's no sort of premium on top for management of these clusters and so on. Um, so I, I, we also have a Terraform hub. If you go to ak.ms slash Terraform hub, you'll get to see how this works and how do you basically set it up. We made it really easy. You just go to Azure, click Terraform, it'll spin it up for you. That's that's as simple as that. Doesn't do you don't need to configure much. Um, and then you can use them in more sophisticated solution architectures, like I just showed you one that we did for uh, the immutable infra, but you can also use it for things like uh, with, with Kubernetes. So you can basically go and say, I have my own private container registry, I'm using Jenkins, I want to do a blue-green deploy to Kubernetes. There's a, there's a talk you'll find 
publicly that my uh, one of the people in my team has done. But how do you do that? So you can actually go into blue green deploys to Kubernetes uh, using a Jenkins Kubernetes plugin. Again, we did, we provided did an open source contribution of something called Kubernetes Deploy, uh, which is just a, a plugin that. Uh, does it across any cloud provider, and then we also have Azure Container Service plugin that does it for uh, for Azure. Um, that's kind of about all I had. Let me just quickly wrap up with a few slides, and then go back to. Uh, I mean, uh, just go back to questions. So, what about my OSS tool? Uh, like you might not have seen your OSS tool working with Terraform here, but we are sort of part of the Azure Container ecosystem which does support most of the things that we want from a um, virtual machine scale sets perspective. These two things we don't support yet in Terraform, but we support everything else that you see here is supported in some way, shape, or form with, with, uh, with Terraform. So we support virtual machine scale sets, virtual machines, container instances, the private registry, if you want to spin up your own Docker Hub, app service, and then we also support MongoDB with Cosmos, uh, Redis, we support Hadoop and whole other things. And then we also have Pivotal is a strong partnership and uh, OpenShift, Red Hat is a strong partnership. We also support the Cloud Foundry uh, Foundation uh, open service broker. So effectively you can sort of spin together the whole thing without needing to use anything sticky if you want, using Terraform and uh, OSBA. So really the idea here is we, we've taken a bunch of bets on these tooling. Uh, and, but you also can use a whole bunch of fully managed services that we now have with Kubernetes, Redis, Hadoop, MongoDB, PostgreSQL, MySQL, and of course Ubuntu. These are fully managed, fully supported services that Microsoft has SLAs behind. And things are, these are things where we do integrations. We don't uh, sort of officially support it, but again, if you, if you pick up a phone and call someone in Azure support, they will get to my team somehow, and then we'll, we'll make sure that we support you. And then we have strong partnerships, of course, like Chef has been our uh, golden partner for a while. Uh, and then we have Red Hat, uh, Hachikov with Vault, and, and with AAD integration, for instance, with Secrets. And then we have Elastic for the uh, Elk clusters. So really, it's been, I know it's been like a marathon. I've been running through a whole bunch of stuff in a very short period of time. I apologize because I had a lot of stuff to share. Um, so if I host you with this stuff, I'll send you some links at the end. Uh, so net net, what I've shown you is you can use a native Terraform instance via Cloud Shell for quick tweaks to infra, and then you can go all the way to a Terraform marketplace for DevOps solutions. What's coming is interesting. So one of the things that's really interesting that we are working on is AZ2TF. You should look at it. So think of it as I have Terraform, but I don't know much about Azure. I'm an AWS guy, or I know I, I just don't know anything about Terraform to begin with. How do I quickly generate this stuff? So what you can do is. Go to Azure portal, manually go and create something, create a really complex network topology, and then say, give me Terraform for that, right? So the reverse engineer is the whole thing. We already do that today. We reverse engineer everything that you can see in the portal in Azure instance to Azure resource manager template, which is a JSON file. What we did was we said, okay, instead of Azure resource management template, we'll convert it to Terraform state template, which is also JSON. It's a more complex uh, for conversion. But we haven't yet got it fully right, that's why it's still gonna be a few months, but once you get it totally right, then you have complete fidelity to convert from what exists in your network infrastructure into a Terraform file, right? And um, the, it's an open source project, you can search for it in GitHub, uh, and any of you are interested in contributing, but that's been a big problem. How do you take these things, make it into infra as code for migration and situations where, or even for learning, right? I just wanna know how the, whether they support it, and how does it work? And then eventually we'll have generator, we do have a generator today which generates, like given a REST API for Azure, a new day REST API comes, it'll spit out a native provider, a Terraform provider for it, but that's just very boilerplate, it's kind of messy. Uh, what we want to give is a tool, so people who want to contribute, let's say, they have their own Azure resource service that they want to generate, make part of Terraform, and they want to contribute to our, our provider repository, we'll give them a tool to do that, for things like, so, and then we're gonna have Service Fabric and a whole bunch of other long pole of things that customers have asked for. Yeah, so basically Terraform, Hashikov has a suite of things like Vault is sort of the analog to Terraform. Terraform for provisioning Vault for secrets. So Vault is basically doing secrets management across different things. <coughs> what we did was we took Vault and we integrated it natively with AAD. So that's showing up, that'll show up uh, in build, which is a couple of weeks from now. I think next next week. So you, you'll, get, uh, you'll get a good understanding of how Vault integrates Azure AD. And all we need, Vault is again a cloud, like multi-cloud 
secrets pro uh, provider, and then you can use uh, AD natively with that. And these are a bunch of links. Uh, you can definitely uh, contact me if you have any questions. Um, and that's about it. Any other questions? Yeah. So I, I think you mentioned in passing Terraform Enterprise. Is it uh, Terraform with support, or is it a different product like Ansible Tower is to a different from Ansible? No, it's beautiful. So Terraform Enterprise is really nice because all it is is it's, it's not for the Terraform code base. It is the Terraform OSS under the covers. So it gives you full fidelity access to everything we do in the provider. It's supported in Terraform Enterprise. And Terraform Enterprise now works on Azure. So think of it as a piece of software. You can install on Azure, and it just works. So it just, it's just a... Uh, and it, what it gives you on top of what Terraform does is native uh, uh, manage remote state and managed identity at scale, but it also gives you uh, collaboration, like team level collaboration, and it gives you Sentinel, which is like governance and policy as code. So it has a bunch of additional value for, as you go from team to enterprise, it's a, it's a, it's a fantastic product. And, and is that how you get commercial support? Also? Yes, that's how you get commercial support. So you, you buy Terraform Enterprise, Hashicorp has a Zendesk and you. You get all the SLAs and everything. Uh, any other questions? Integration with Mesos and Swarm compared to Kubernetes? Because you mentioned Kubernetes multiple times. But so Kubernetes, again, is what Microsoft has taken a big bet on as a managed service. It's like a managed service. Right. We integrate with Mesos and we integrate with uh, uh, Swarm as part of, not Swarm, Docker Enterprise now, right. as part of the... Uh, uh, Azure Container Service. So Azure Container Service will continue to exist and will support it, but it's not a fully managed service. It'll create it in your own subscription. So when you create a Mesos cluster, it's just making it really simple for you, but it's in your subscription. Whereas Kubernetes, just you just don't know what's created under the covers. It's, it's a completely managed thing. That's the difference. So it sounds like Terraform is good for creating lots of things, but what about like maintenance? So you want to change your host types or yep. is it I mean, can you configure that and have it? You can, but you shouldn't. I mean, people do, but they get carried away with Terraform so lovely that they start doing it. I really want to use something like Ansible, something really lightweight for that kind of thing. Or if you're doing, if you're in the What's container saying, land, you do something like Rancher, for example. Well, I was thinking some part of it, like another part, maybe your load balancer, you want to change the setting. Or whatever. Those you could do, yes. Those, that's what it's for. So if you're, if you're doing provisioning of infrastructure, no matter how sophisticated that infrastructure, all the way from load balancer function, any setting of that, Terraform will do really well. Okay. But as soon as you go to the layer above it, let's say, uh, then Terraform has itself integrated things like Chef and Kubernetes as independent provisioners. Yeah. You can use like a remote exec provisioner with Ansible, for example, or Salt. Yeah. And those are the things that actually are good at the actual deployment piece of it. So it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it integrates well with those, so you can just use those. Anything, any other questions? <laughs>